We continue with our discussion on your book, uh, Beyond Innocence and Redemption, Confronting the Holocaust and Israeli Power, Creating a Moral Future for the Jewish People, which you wrote 30 years ago. And uh, uh, for uh, our discussion uh, uh, tonight, uh, your morning, where we will look at uh, chapter two, which is entitled Memory, Memory as Burden and Possibility, Alternative Views of Holocaust and Israel. So last time we talked about uh, Holocaust theology re represented by Wiesel, uh, Fackenheim, and Rabbi uh, Greenberg. And uh, so this part uh, you uh, discussed uh, you, uh, the uh, alternative views of Holocaust represented by Philip Lopate, Avishai Margalit, and uh, Boaz Evron. So, um, uh, and the uh, alternative views of Israel are represented by uh, Ahad Ha'am, Judah Magnus, and of course, uh, Hannah Arendt. Now, to begin with, I have to say uh, that, you know, I, I find this chapter uh, very engaging. Uh, and uh, you, I could really see the, the level of, uh, you know, the passionate discussion and argument. And uh, there's uh, the, the depth of the, the, uh, the exchange is, uh, is quite something. I, I was really taken by it. And, I, and to be honest, you know, I, I, I seem to be missing this kind of uh, uh, argumentation in, in, uh, in the present discourse on Israel, Palestine. Um, uh, so, and, and uh, my, another observation of mine is that uh, the way you bring this out, uh, bring all of this, you put them together, it's really a, 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 a way of uh, uh, bringing out the Jewish tradition of uh, dissent, which you, you would, uh, we will discuss in the next chapter. It's, you know, you can talk about uh, uh, Holocaust and Israel uh, from a political uh, point of view, and, and that's fine. But to uh, talk about it in uh, in the within the Jewish tradition, which you 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 did in this book, is is I think by made, that made you a, a distinct uh, a Jewish thinker and writer uh, during this time. Um, so let, let's start with the alternative views of the Holocaust. Uh, let's begin with Philip Lope. Very, very. Uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, with a lot of chutzpah. So uh, you, you began with a, with a uh, comment on his essay, uh, Resistance to the Holocaust. And I, I'd like to quote uh, 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 from this essay. Um, it's really anti Wiesel, I have to say. So it, Lopate was reacting to the use of the term Holocaust. Uh, of course, the Holocaust is a religious connotation, but he was reacting um, uh, to how, uh, how Holocaust became uh, you know, an industry of um, uh, sentimentality. Uh, as, and and, uh, and uh, I, I quote, um, I, I would quote um, him from this essay. So he said, one instantly saw that the term Holocaust was part of a polemic and that it sounded more comfortable in certain speakers' mouths than in others. The Holocaustians use it like a club to smash back, to smash back their opponents. In my own mind, I continue to distinguish ever so slightly between the disaster visited on the Jews and the Holocaust. Sometimes, and this is uh, the anti Wiesel uh, part, sometimes it almost seems that the Holocaust is a corporation headed by Elie Wiesel, who defends his patents with articles in the arts and leisure section of the Sunday Times. Wow. Yeah. 
So uh, what, 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 what were you thinking when you read it? Uh, at the time, at the height of the uh, uh, Palestinian uprising. Yeah. Well, I think it had been building up for years in the Jewish community. Uh, after the second uprising, I wrote an article that uh, titled The Jewish Civil War. Uh, but uh, if you look at the tradition of dissent in relation to the way the Holocaust is seen and used, not the Holocaust itself, and the way Israel is seen and used, there has been resistance from the beginning. And here during the uprising, which was the last time the Jewish community as a community really tried to come to grips with what Israel was becoming or had become or was always. Uh, this is an example, Lopate is uh, saying, look, get off my back. The Holocaust is being used as a bully. It's become a business. There's a lot of money around it and there's a lot of power around it. And it's being used to shut down dissent from Palestinians, from others who are neither Palestinian nor Jewish, and from Jews within the Jewish community. It becomes a bully shutting down dissent by just using the term, by invoking the Holocaust. And at the same time, it's trivializing the suffering in the Holocaust. So he isn't talking about forgetting the Holocaust. He's saying, don't trivialize it by using it as a blunt instrument against those who are trying to find a way forward. Uh, so this is Holocaust as kitsch from his perspective and others, where you just shut down an argument by saying Holocaust. But the people who are saying it are also hiding something, which is other Jewish voices and what Israel has done and is doing to the Palestinian people. He's trying to break it open through his own sense of humor. Uh, he's engaging in, in undermining through a kind of humorous but very serious attack because he has something to say and other Jews have something to say which can't be said when you just clamp down Holocaust. Yeah. And any Jewish center then and now has experienced this attempt to shut down the voice of dissent through simply invoking this image of the Holocaust. Yeah, so it's like a, you know, uh... It, it maybe sound like uh, quite uh, blasphemous uh, because you know the Holocaust during uh, Wiesel's time uh, and the, with the Holocaust theologians, they have sort of elevated the Holocaust or the remembrance of the Holocaust almost as a religious obligation. So it, yes, you know, I've, written, uh, I've written about that in the Holocaust theologians. It is the religious obligation of Jews. But it's not only the Holocaust theologian, it filters through Jewish life. So you get these local rabbis and these local Jewish boards and synagogues, and they see it as a sacred obligation to stifle dissent. And again, here we have, as Holocaust theologians understood, the prophetic coming home. And this is the prophetic coming home is saying, wait a minute, you're using this terminology and this event to shut us down. Shouldn't it be opening us up? Uh, so uh, basically Wiesel uh, sees himself and others see him as a prophet, but Lopate is basically saying, no, you're doing the opposite. You're trying to keep the prophetic within us down. You're disciplining the prophetic through by way of invoking the Holocaust as an image of Jewish suffering with which now here's another part. We're not suffering today. We did suffer. Right. So you're invoking this image as a continuation of our suffering when in fact we have power. If we're only suffering, that's one thing. If we suffered and now we have power, you can't use that image to shut down the critique of power. And this is, again, beyond innocence and redemption. Uh, it's keeping us Jews 
in a past time, which is convenient for us because it limits our responsibility for now. And that's when Holocaust becomes a bully and when it becomes kitsch. You trivialize the Holocaust by putting it in a place that it shouldn't be. Yeah, and uh, uh, Avishai Magalit, uh, Professor uh, Magalit, also said something about, you know, it's, it's a kitsch. And in fact, he, <laughs> he said that, you know, the kitsch man of genius like Elie Wiesel. <laughs> uh, wow, that was... Um, and he was, he was actually uh, quite against, you know, the, uh, the memorialization of the Holocaust in the form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, Holocaust, uh, Holocaust memorials uh, like the Yad Vashem and the Holocaust memorial in, in Israel, because it has become, uh, you know, an element of state catch. Yeah, this is, Very but small. we want to be, be careful because the Holocaust is real was real and significant. What they're complaining about is the use of it in an improper way. So to shut down dissent or to enable state power, especially unjust state power or the use of it, this is so wrong, it means that ultimately the Holocaust will not be able to be raised as an issue, which has actually come true. Uh, so. I don't want to, uh, and sometimes people can come down on Wiesel. Now, Wiesel made millions and millions of dollars uh, speaking about the Holocaust and others. So the Holocaust as an industry, which is some talk about it, I understand that point. I, I want to make sure that I'm not seen as someone who simply diminishes Edie Wiesel. There are many reasons to diminish his witness about the way he used things and the, what he did and didn't do especially his silence on Palestinians, but his experience was real. The Holocaust was real. So I want to, in a sense, bring these voices to the table, but not to simply say, oh, that's stupid stuff. The Holocaust, don't talk about that. I, that's not where I am. Yeah, the that's, Holocaust, also, that's also trivializing it. Uh, yeah, I, I, the Holocaust is, is central. Yeah. Uh, and it happened to the Jews of Europe and it was uh, a long culmination of a long history of anti-Semitism. And that's extremely important. So we don't want to lose that. We also don't want to lose it by misusing it. Right. So just to be and, clear, you know, not, none of this you have mentioned here are trying to deny <laughs> the Holocaust or say that it is not important. They say okay. that it is important but it is how it functions uh, in terms of stifling dissent that they are yeah. Uh, against us. Yeah, and I think it's hard with Jews because of the ambivalence about Jews through history and today. It's very hard to walk this line uh, that these events, the Holocaust was real. The mass murder of 6 million Jews, real, awful, beyond really uh, our imagination uh, but the use of it makes it more difficult to use it even as a resource for the present because it's been abused and it's ended up enabling the oppression of others. And Elie Wiesel is a central figure in this because he became the poster boy of the Holocaust and his experience was real. But he used it in a way to silence dissent. And therefore, he didn't help create a future for the Jewish people. He, in fact, froze us in a time where we were suffering, mm -hmm. but now we had power. So this internal, uh, internal Jewish discussions or argumentations can often be brutal, too. And uh, uh, so you need to navigate even this Jewish civil war lest you begin to trivialize Jewish history, which has happened partly because of Israel's trivialization, partly because of Bizel's trivialization, and partly because there are people who want to trivialize Jewish history. It's a, 
a very complex web. Uh, and we have to be very uh, careful, uh, but also we have to speak the truth as we see it. Right. Uh, and uh, here, here I'd like to, you know, he, he uh, Mar uh, Margalit also talks about, uh, you know, uh, about the making the Holocaust a, a, a kitsch. And um, I'd just like to uh, read from, you know, what he, he from his conclusion. Uh, against the weapon of the Holocaust, the Palestinians are amateurs. Uh, true, some of them have adopted their own version of Holocaust sketch based on the revolting equation of the Israelis with uh, Nazis and of themselves with Nazis victims. But as soon as operation, Holocaust memory is put into high gear by the Israeli authorities with full-fledged sound and color production. The Palestinians cannot compete. So here he was talking about, you know, making the Holocaust as a, a unique Jewish experience that the Palestinians could not even say, uh, could, it, it could even, could not make any similarities of, of their oppression to, to, to the oppression of the Jews. Well, I, 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 again, here we have to walk a fine line. Mm -hmm. There are many, uh, during the Palestinian uprising, there were Jews like Margalit and others whom I talk about in the book, who talked about Israeli Jews acting like Nazis or using Nazi imagery. They weren't comparing uh, what was happening to Palestinians to the Holocaust, but they were using resources within Jewish history to say, do we want to act like that? So there isn't a comparison, in my view, between the Holocaust and what happened to Europe's Jews and what's happening and what's been happening to Palestinians. Although the early part of the Nazi period, and this was written about by some Jews during the uprising, the early years, there are some comparisons, but that's not what's happening in most Israeli literature. What they're saying is, do we want to become like those who oppressed us? And of course, the most reasonable and close at hand analogy is the Nazi experience, but it's a kind of an image which saying, are we becoming like them? Uh, so Israelis are not Nazis, but can there be a Jewish fascism toward Palestinians? Yes. And Palestinians, of course, are looking for imagery to publicize their plight. So if you're gonna make the Holocaust as the reason for doing these things against Palestinians, don't you think they're gonna use the fact that they are quote, victims of this Holocaust imagery? When you make it public and you use it to oppress another people, the oppressed are going to use what they need to publicize their plight. So it becomes a, a kind of an intricate web that you sometimes can't get out of. But in general, Jews, they're not saying we are Nazis, but we're acting too much like them. We're coming too close to it. Is this what we want for our future? And it becomes, of course, but invoking the Holocaust then is invoking it against this what was a subversive theology, which has now become orthodoxy. And now they're trying to subvert the orthodoxy. How do you subvert the orthodoxy? By using the imagery of the orthodox against itself. I see. Uh, uh, let me be, because this is really not, uh, not so, uh, clear to me at the moment about all of uh, these uh, arguments about uh, that the Holocaust is a unique, uh, unique experience of the Jewish people, and also not so unique. Uh, well, what, what can you say about that? And how does the Holocaust? Oh, this sorry. is hot, hotly contested. Uh, yeah. oh, so everything is hotly contested, especially now. I'm very traditional. Mm -hmm. So I must say that I believe the Holocaust is unique. Now, 
it is also true that every event is unique in its own way. And to, uh, you don't want to lump things together because it diminishes both one thing and the other. So what's happening to Palestinians is not the Holocaust. What's happening to Palestinians is what's happening to Palestinians. Yeah, the fine. Holocaust is not happening to Jews now. It happened. It, it's not happening to us. So, uh, but uh, when I, uh, I'm very traditional and it, I can be criticized for it. So I'll take the criticism. Uh, the Holocaust reading and studying it is endless to me. You always find something that you couldn't imagine uh, even when you quote, know everything about the Holocaust. But the way it's being used, and, and that can be debated. And first of all, peoples can see their experience as unique, whether it is or not. It's just like, I believe Christians can believe what they want as long as they don't use it against others. Jews can believe what they want as long as they don't use it against others. Muslims can believe what they want as long as they don't use it against others. We can go on and on and on. When you use it against others, you're open to critique. So I do believe that the Holocaust was unique and others should talk about their own suffering in the way that they want to, and they need to, and I need to listen to that too. But when we use it against others in an oppressive way, I have to say stop. Now there are those people who believe that the Holocaust was not unique and they talk about other experiences of suffering and uh, that has to be listened to as well. We're talking here, not about the event itself, but how it functions in the present. And when you mobilize the memory of suffering to oppress another people, the memory of suffering is gonna be questioned. And it's gonna be hit at because the power against another is unjust. And that's where I, am on this. I'm, I'm willing to listen to questions about the Holocaust event mm -hmm. as long as it's not diminished. Whether it's unique or not, we could discuss. But when we use it against others as a form of oppression, the answer is no, I'm going to stand with those who are being oppressed. That doesn't diminish the Holocaust for me. It makes it more significant. The question for Jews is, in this history of suffering, which we have experienced, which was real and long, what do we do when we have power? Does the abuse of our power against Palestinians fulfill our responsibility to the memory of Jewish suffering? Or does it actually extend it and trauma further traumatize it by traumatizing another people? So I'm in some ways very traditional and I'll own up to that. That's the way I studied it and the way I entered it. But I also am not going to allow it to be used against others without using my voice to say no. Okay, now th this, has not, this was not uh, really discussed but I, I'd like to bring it up. Um... Uh, because I, uh, uh, this is in relation to the uh, memorialization of the Holocaust. And, you know, I, I've been to both um, uh, ho uh, Holocaust memorials. I've been to Yad Vashem in Israel, and I've also been to the uh, Holocaust uh, Museum in, in, uh, uh, in D.C. Um, um, what, uh, and it's true that, you know, they, they really evoke uh, emotions and uh, and it's uh, you know it's uh, when you're uh, when you are there you know it's it's just uh, for me it's just uh, a human reaction to the suffering that you 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 feel the empathy you feel the you know uh, you you feel uh, uh, devastated by the the enormous suffering that the people suffered but as, as you, you said but is there a difference uh, between and now I'm thinking. Is there a difference in how the Holocaust function in Israel and in the U.S.? Yes, uh, yes and no, and no and yes. But for okay. instance, uh, Elie Wiesel was often, often mocked in Israel uh, because Israelis know what they've done. 
Israelis know that Israel is not a dream. It's a real place. And since most Israelis have served in the army, they know what they've done to Palestinians. So, and part of Israel was to get away from the Holocaust and the, what they considered the weak diaspora Jewish experience. They wanted to leave that behind. That's part of the state of Israel was to say, that's it. The end of Jewish martyrdom, as we talked about last time with Fackenheim, and the end of the end of, of thinking of Jews as weak and unable to defend themselves. So part of Israel is to get away from that history. Uh, but then through the Eichmann trial and through political decisions and maybe through time, uh, the Holocaust became more important in Israel uh, in the 1960s and beyond. Uh, and, but still, they're uneasy about memorialization, especially coming from the United States and people like Wiesel, because they think it's a, a woe unto us kind of thing. And they're thinking, hey, we can defend ourselves. This is a new chapter in Jewish history. So we also have that internal, uh, which really is a civil war over memory of the Holocaust. It's used in Israel, but in general, they've wanted to be distant from that because they want to create a future that has no Jewish suffering. Uh, they don't want to dwell on the suffering, whereas in the United States, where Jews are empowered too in a different way, this Holocaust imagery gave us license to talk about our empowerment in the United States as if we were also innocent in that empowerment. Yeah, so yeah, it was used and, and in uh, status and answer. In Israel, uh, that, that, that's not uh, what they want. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I think uh, a lot of, I mean, from Amer uh, American Jews, uh, a lot of uh, uh, playing on guilt, uh, as, uh, you know, as uh, Boaz Evron would say, it, it, it played a lot on, the, on uh, guilt. Uh, from uh, you know, uh, uh, from the uh, inadequate response of uh, American Jews to the Holocaust. Well, that's another again. That that's another element. I mean, we could I could write book after book after book on each chapter, uh, yeah. trying to narrate. But you're right. That's another discussion. What did and even in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. You have, uh, if you look through the museum, you have two parts of the museum. You have Elie Wiesel, this kind of mystical understanding of the Holocaust, and my teacher, Richard Rubenstein, a very methodical understanding of the Holocaust. And one of the architects of the intellectual architects of the museum was uh, Michael Bernbaum, who was a student of Rubenstein's as well. So, uh, but in, in the Holocaust Memorial Museum, you have the United States as a beacon of hope. But the question that's there too, but not in the museum so much, is what did the US do? Did they really want Jewish refugees? Why didn't they prosecute a war uh, to save Jews and all of that? So that, that's a whole nother element. When you begin to look at the Holocaust historically, not just as an image. Uh, now, we need to have both because a people's history is not only 1941, July 7th, 1943, August 12th. Uh, a people's history is made of formative events, which are usually seen in a quasi-religious framework. And then there are dissenters that say, well, wait a minute, that, what happened here and what didn't happen here? And, and this is what Jewish dissenters are saying, but we need to keep both together because the Holocaust is a massive event and shouldn't be just picked apart, but it also can't be mobilized against others. And I think that's the beauty of the, you know, this uh, descent. This, you know, uh, there's not, there's no one uh, definite uh, fixed interpretation of uh, of a, of, of a uh, formative event, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, even how the Bible is interpreted. <laughs> you have a lot of uh, Jewish uh, disputations. Uh, oh, totally. 
Talmudic argument, but with a lot of uh, passion as Talmudic arguments can be uh, in real time. Now we're not looking at a, a text or the Bible or, or the Torah. We're looking at an ongoing event yeah. of the uprising and Jews wanting to keep it down, the descent, and Jews wanting to open it up because we're creating a future that some Jews want and other Jews are horrified by. Yeah, and uh, I, I have to uh, I have to apologize. I made the mistake. I I only mentioned the three. Actually, there's a fourth one, very important. <laughs> uh, your teacher, Richard Rubenstein. So we have actually four uh, uh, representative of the alternative views of the Holocaust, and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a great mistake because uh, <laughs> Rubenstein is your teacher, and I also read his you know after Auschwitz and the cunning of history. Anyway, we will yeah, go. Well, we will go to. But I think it's important because Rubenstein uh, is, is in the mix, but he's basically saying to Wiesel, you're romanticizing Jewishness. So he's a critic, but he also believes that Jews should use their power in any way we need to, to secure our future. Although Rubenstein, in a sense, doesn't believe in a Jewish future. So he's very complicated, but he's not going to get into this imagery of this massive imagery, he's just saying, look, this happened to us. I'm going to tell you why it happened to us. We're going to make sure it doesn't happen to us again. We need to use power. Palestinians have an argument against Israel, and it's real tough. That's what Rubenstein says. You're either up or down in history. We've been down. Now we're up. If you're down, Palestinians, tough, because we need to be up because if we're down, we're dead. So Rubenstein's another element of this who is not liberal or conservative. He's an insurgent in a very different kind of way, uh, but part of the mix. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, Rubenstein, and also now I'm, I'm uh, going to Boas uh, Evron, and actually including the, the two previous uh, uh, um, dissenters, uh, Lopate and uh, Margalit, uh, they, I think basic, a, a basic, uh, uh, a common uh, argument uh, from them is that this be a historical interpretation of the Holocaust. I think that, that's, that's what they are really arguing about that, you know, uh, we have mythologized uh, the Holocaust, remove it from history, and as you said, and this is, I, I'm quoting you, that without history, there is no accountability. So th they're saying that, you know, uh, that we cannot make an, an, an a historical interpretation of the Holocaust. And, and that, that's not, that's really trivializing it. That's really not doing justice to the victims of Holocaust. And uh, uh, here, I, I'd like to, uh, read uh, a portion from your book, and you were commenting on Boaz Evron uh, on his in his essay, "The Holocaust: Learning the Wrong Lessons." And he was talking about what should the lessons of the Holocaust, uh, what should be the right uh, lessons uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, um, yes, he, here's your uh, uh, comment on. Uh, uh, Boaz Evron, the historical interpretation of the Holocaust made deliberately or out of ignorance had become in Evron's mind a danger both to the Jewish people and to the state of Israel for the following reasons. The term Holocaust is rhetorical and ambiguous. It exists without historical reference and thus has become indefinite and movable, almost accepting one from understanding it. The murder of the Jews in Europe, though not as galvanizing, more uh, accurately reflects and locates a historical event in which there were murderers and those who were murdered. Yeah, again, it's uh, the mixing up of, uh, it's kind of a mythic thing. It's sort of like the Catholic mass. You, you have, 
you have the story of Jesus in the Gospels. That's also already a, a mythos. Mm-hmm. And then you have a Catholic mass that has a, a, a mythic reality, which is a liturgical. And the Holocaust uh, with Wiesel is a liturgy. So when you're in church and you're at mass, you don't say, well, did Jesus, who was Jesus really? And uh, did that really happen? And was there a woman with perfume? And did he eat with uh, tax men and prostitutes? And did he heal this one and that one? And did he rise from the, you know, you have all these questions which are real historical questions, but at mass, you don't ask them. You just say, yeah, and you recite a creed. And then uh, my favorite is then he will come again. And this has been, you know, for 2000 years. And so you're thinking, when do they say, well, maybe not. Uh, it's a long time, Jewish humor, it's a long time. Um, <laughs> and that mass has been used against indigenous peoples around the world, hasn't it? Brutally. I mean, we talk about a, a brutal use. Now there are those who then say, you know, that's it, I'm done with it. Yeah. This is so over the atrocity, we can't deal with it anymore. And there are those who say, but it's intimate. Anyway. My point is that the Holocaust is intimate uh, in the, it, to Jews in the Jewish community in general. And those who argue against it argue with such passion, it shows an intimacy too. It's defining. The question is, what are we going to do with it? And when it becomes ahistorical completely, then we're in a different ballpark, a different ballgame. It has to be ahistorical to some extent, but when mobilized with power and injustice, then it becomes unacceptable. So when you have a Catholic mass and the people in the church are just there in this mythos, no problem. When you leave the church and you go to a Jewish ghetto and you begin to oppress Jews, you begin to uh, use uh, bullying tactics against them, then No, the same thing I say about Christian Zionists. They can believe what they want. They just can't act in a way that oppresses Palestinians. So I want to make that distinction. What Jews believe about the Holocaust, ahistorical or historical is one thing. What we do with the Holocaust is another thing. These Jews are saying, you're taking this out of history and we're creating another history with it which is so detrimental to others and to us that I'm not going to go to the ahistorical at any level. Yeah, but in a way, this, uh, you know, their argument, uh, or I think that's a very strong argument because when you look at the Holocaust as a, as a myth, as a, as a, as a religious uh, belief, then you cannot question it. But if you look at it as a, as a history as an event in history, then you, you, you would have a different uh, perspective depending on how you, uh, where you are in that uh, history. Yes, but you lose the sense of its significance beyond the historical detail, then you've missed something about the Holocaust too. There's a balance. Uh, it's just like when you dissect uh, Christian life, at the end of it, you'd have to say, I. I this doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense to a lot of people. And the question is why? Uh, so it's a very difficult question. So I leave it to how people perceive life is one thing. What they do with it is another. So I'm, I'm very much, uh, you know, if a Jew wants to say the Holocaust is unique, no problem, but don't use that against Palestinians. If a Jew wants to say, I don't want anything to do with the Holocaust. It's not unique. That's their thing. Uh, But we have to be wary of what is done with any of these beliefs uh, in history, not the belief itself. So when Wiesel wrote Night, he didn't know he would become famous and wealthy and become uh, a corporation. Mm -hmm. Give him a break. He didn't know that. But that's what it became. Now I wanna separate the two. His experience was real. What he did with the experience and how he perceived it in his own writing or in his own home or in his synagogue 
or among a small group of people, no problem. I can argue, I can agree, I can disagree, I can like, I can not like. But what he did with it publicly was wrong, ultimately. And that diminished his witness and actually trivialized it. Did that mean that he never had that experience or was never trying to be faithful to that experience? No, I don't think so. I think he, he was. But something happened along the way that got him on the wrong path. And that's where he needs to be criticized, in my view. Not, not with how he... Uh, he no, if someone in a death camp and lost their family in the Holocaust, leave them alone. Let them think about it and remember it in the way they want. If you're going to take it public mm -hmm. and you have power and others use that power against others further, then that's a different issue. I don't want to get into, this is the problem with some of Jewish descent, uh, and I won't name them, but they begin to investigate people's lives, every detail and point out every flaw in them. And it, 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 okay, we're all flawed. Uh, we need to have a distinction between how we perceive experience and what we do with it. Uh, and what we do with it, if it's wrong, needs to be criticized. What we hold in our interior should be led us, should be allowed our freedom uh, to believe. So for instance, if somebody wants to believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, no problem. If they want to mobilize an army against non-Christians to convert them, that's a problem. And of course that, that is the problem of Christianity, not the belief itself but the use of that belief with power to become an imperial power itself. And uh, I'm very much for Jews to feel the way they want, but when they use it against others, Jewish dissenters or Palestinians, then the answer is it stops there. That needs to be stopped. I hear you. Yeah, that, that's true that it's really the beliefs that has galvanized you know, people to uh, to uh, to uh, commit atrocities in history. Sometimes yeah. that needs to be stopped. It, it, that the Holocaust created trauma in the Jewish community is real. If we use it to cause trauma to others, we have to be stopped. This is called a, a psychological intervention. <laughs> and I've written about that before, years ago, maybe during this period of time, where we needed an intervention against us. Israel needed to be stopped. The idea would be, even in Beyond Innocence and Redemption, if we could stop ourselves, that would be best. But if we can't stop ourselves, we need to be stopped. And uh, the memory of the Holocaust can be held in different ways, but when it's used, mobilized to oppress another people, it needs to be stopped full force. Okay. Now, uh, Professor Ellis, I'd like to uh, continue with, you know, uh, uh, because I really want to discuss about the uh, Boaz Ebron's thoughts and how uh, the Holocaust function. Uh, and this is uh, because I think this is something very relevant. And he said that the, 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 the lessons of the Holocaust are actually, uh, you know, it, uh, you can see that it, how it functions in terms of uh, you know how it uh, function in in terms of uh, um, you know um, Germany and the uh, how it functioned among uh, uh, the American Jewish establishment and also the Israeli Jewish establishment. Uh, what I find very interesting is how um, you know. Uh, how he looked at how the, the Holocaust functioned uh, in Europe, especially with Germany. So here, uh, I, and I, I read, according to Evron, the Germans were interested in this, uh, in this use of the Holocaust because it limited, in a sense, their liability. Instead of focusing on the systemic and expanding possibilities of a system of extermination, 
a focus that might have kept alive the feelings of fear and suspicion after the war in Germany's neighbors, limiting the memory to the Jews and the Holocaust enabled Germany to more easily reintegrate itself into the world of nations. The Western powers were also interested in this in so far as it allowed them to wipe the state clean and begin to rebuild Germany as a barrier to Soviet expansion. Now, this is really very controversial. And well, the Germans are what I call, I've written, uh, repentant enablers. Uh, the, they realized, again, first of all, there was a genuine sense among many Germans, uh, we, I don't know what percentage, I don't, of there's something terribly wrong. This was, to, this was completely wrong. Okay, so there was a repentance among some Germans, but the political elite also had a mission, which is part of their mission. And that was to bring Germany back from its defeat, which it has. And so the European Union, my own sense is that the European Union is an attempt to discipline Germany and also for Germans to come back and become the dominant economic power in Europe, which they have. And by use, they use the Holocaust to get back. Now, whatever I'm saying is that even though they are repentant for the Holocaust and they also pay, have paid billions of dollars to Israel uh, and all sorts of things with Israel, which gives Germany a sense, a relief that this is their repentance. Uh, it also uh, had a way of limiting their liability. Yeah, so it, it's an interesting argument uh, and Germany has accomplished uh, quite a lot through repentance. And now some of it is genuine. Some Germans are absolutely horrified by the Holocaust, but it was also a political strategy, uh, which Israel first didn't want because they saw this as a way of limiting their liability and mm -hmm. then took because they knew it would enhance their power. Yeah. So Israel uh, also, I mean, there were many Jews in Israel that said, no, we don't want anything to do with Germany. We don't want that money. It's blood money. Mm -hmm. And then the political elite in Israel said, no, we'll use it. And now, uh, for instance, German uh, Air Force are being trained by the Israelis uh, upping. The, yeah, it's a fascinating. That's a whole nother. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's another yeah. book. <laughs> yeah. Well, and of course, the victims are the Palestinians. But the Palestinians are not important to Europe. Jews are. Yeah. Well, so, why is well, that? Because Palestinians are seen as Arab, obviously, Middle Eastern. Uh, but uh, Jewish history in Europe is the moral call after the Holocaust. Now, there's political dimensions of that moral call. The moral call was real but there are political dimensions and Germany used the Holocaust. You say, how could you use such a terrible event that you perpetrated on the Jewish people as a way to reintegrate yourself? But by the way, Christians used it too. The Christian love of the Jews, which is quite new, and even Vatican II, was a way to regain credibility for a Christianity that was covered with blood. Now, some Christians, really wanted to repent for the Holocaust, no question. But that was also a church, Catholic church and Protestant church strategy to change their theology toward the Jews in order to make Christianity more credible after the Holocaust. So there's a, yeah, and again- You mean Christian, Christian Germans? Not just Christian Germans, European, think about European Christianity sitting there after six million Jews have been murdered on their soil in Christian Europe. Think, think what that means. And many Christians were saying, what? I can't even, I'm ashamed. And there were Christians who were ashamed. But the church as a corporation had to make decisions about how do we lift ourselves up out of this blood. One of the ways was romanticizing Jews, which becomes uh, philo-Semitism. 
a philo-Semitism, which becomes the center of the interfaith ecumenical dialogue, which morphs into the interfaith ecumenical deal. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah that's, an, that's another <laughs> chapter. <laughs> that's another chapter. <laughs> it's all linked together. Yeah, and, and actually we will talk about that uh, in, in your, in, in another book, uh, Unholy Alliance. Uh, yes. But that, that's already a preview. Okay, and uh, and this would be the last one, uh, the last point for uh, uh, for uh, uh, everyone. Uh, you talk about the Jewish monopolization of the Nazi experience. You know, I mean, the, the Nazi uh, have victimized not only Jews. You know, uh, but it has uh, the focus has been on the and of and of course because of the sheer number of uh, the victims compared you know to the gypsies and jehovah's uh, witnesses and uh, yeah so and then so the last point uh, uh, before we uh, before we move to the uh, the uh, the centers on the, the state of israel uh, he, uh, about uh, and i want to get your opinion about uh, what he said that how the holocaust was also uh, used by the israeli and Jewish leadership in the United States. Uh, let me read this part. The Holocaust can also be used as a power to, powerful tool by Israeli and Jewish leadership in the United States to organize and police the Jewish community. Diaspora Jews, for example, are made to feel guilty for not having done enough to prevent the Holocaust. At the same time, the message is conveyed that Israel is threatened with annihilation. The message is clear, unequivocal support for Israel to prevent a second Holocaust. Evron sees the image of Holocaust past as Holocaust future as, as, as so important to, to Israel and American Jewry that the reality of Israel's threat is submerged in myth. Yes, this is Holocaust theology too. Holocaust theology basically says our future is another Holocaust. Israel is the bulwark in Holocaust theology against another Holocaust, which is almost inevitable. And that's why we have to constantly be on guard. Uh, there's no room for, there's no margin for error. If we let our guard down, we're finished. And we know about that because that already happened. Israel is the symbol and the concrete reality of our survival. That's what Holocaust theology uh, is about, but it's constantly threatened. It's a theology that constantly has to see the threat of a second Holocaust and to constantly beat it back. That's why we have to limit historical investigation into the diversity of the Holocaust and the other communities that have suffered during the Holocaust. We have to keep the focus on us because others want to flatten out our experience. This goes back to the Hebrew Bible. This goes back to the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, where Jews are always fearing that we're gonna disappear from the world's existence if we don't emphasize our uniqueness. This is a wonderful thing and a maddening thing about being Jewish. I love the, uh, I love the interplay. Uh, and my own view on this is that Jews have a right to emphasize the Jewish Holocaust and others have a right to raise their voices too. But it's also true that through our empowerment, we have effectively drowned out other voices. Right. Now, this is part of the Jewish drama in the Hebrew Bible. All of a sudden, this nothing of a people is the center of history. It's, a, it's an amazing claim. We, we become the center of world history in the Bible. But Christians should be very careful because they think the center of uh, history is this Jewish guy who nobody probably even heard of at the time. So everybody puts themselves at the center. So we can't complain about that because the people who complain about Jews placing themselves at the center are usually placing themselves at the center. So I understand that. However, it is also true that we don't talk about the, the non-Jewish Poles, the non-Jewish Lithuanians, the non-Jewish Ukrainians, the non-Jewish Russians. 
We don't talk about that suffering. And we've deliberately, through Wiesel and others, kept that out. And they have a right to complain about that. Uh, and it also limits our ability to see the Holocaust in different ways in history, which allows it to become a bully. All of these things are tied together. Now, how do we break that bulliness down without losing the significance of the Holocaust? That's, that's the question, uh, I think, for us. Yeah, and that, that, that's a, a real challenge. Uh, right. Uh, now, the, the last, uh, you know, the, the last uh, uh, figure that you uh, included in the you know, alternative views of the Holocaust is your teacher, Richard Rubenstein. And, uh, you know, I, I, he's, I find his, uh, the cunning of history a, a very provocative and, and powerful. Uh, you know, I have never really looked at history that way. Uh, and, but his take on the Holocaust is very interesting. And uh, among the three, he, he was the one who really uh, raised the issue of uh, Christendom, the, the role of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Christian contempt toward the Jews that, uh, you know, uh, uh, has uh, been the foundation uh, uh, for the cultural conditioning of the, uh, of, uh, uh, against Jews. Uh, so he called the, the Holocaust a paradigm. Um, like, could, you, could you talk more about that? The Holocaust well, as a paradigm. He's the Holocaust as a, particularly against Jews. That's after Auschwitz. But in the cunning of history, he sees what happened to the Jews as a paradigm for the future of the world. Um, about uh, how social and economic and political technology and ideology can be used to isolate people, to make vast populations superfluous and their fate, the super, super, defined superfluous peoples is uh, a living death and death itself. So he wants to take the Holocaust out of a particularly Jewish perspective in this book although he emphasizes what happened mm -hmm. to Jews uh, and look at how this applies to others with advanced technology and bureaucracy and the ways of the world, which take power unto itself and defines most of the world as outside of that power and as limiting that power and as a drag on that power. And so he has a very dystopian view of the future of the world, it, when you see the Holocaust as a paradigm, not for what happened to Jews or what might happen to Jews again, but what will happen and has happened in different ways to other peoples in the world. Yeah, I, it's, that's true. It, it's really dystopic. Uh, uh, when I read The Cunning of History, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, the Holocaust as a part, it would always hover. It, uh, it will always hover uh, above us. You know, there's always a threat of a, a, another Holocaust. And it, that is because um, it's, just, uh, it's, it's basically the foundation of uh, modernity. Uh, and if you look at the uh, political, economic, and cultural. Yeah, he is saying that, and this is his argument about Israel. Uh, the world uh, populations may go down the only way to protect your population or your community is through power. So Jews don't want to be in a situation where the world is populations are going down because we may get caught up in it again. And as particularly Jewish focused by others as culprits. But he's expanding this vision that modern world and the separation of God and the earth and the modern bureaucracy and technology, and this is written in the 1970s, so we've gone way beyond that, mm. is defining the world as those who are worthy of being saved and those who are unworthy. And we know from the Holocaust, but this will be the future, that the unworthy, defined as unworthy, 
are doomed. Now, Rubenstein also doesn't believe there's a way out of this. Uh, for Rubenstein, history is a cycle of violence and atrocity with no end. So if you can get power, get it, because if you don't have it, you're dead. We'd like everyone to survive, but there are gonna be choices made. Superfluous populations as defined are doomed. And that's most of the world for Rubenstein. And Jews were the superfluous people of Europe. That's how Rubenstein sees this paradigm. Once they were defined as superfluous, defied, uh, of deprived of citizenship, for instance, and this is very interesting in today's world, right? With refugee populations increasing. If you're not protected by the state, you're killed by it. Yeah, I mean, you have no rights, uh, basically. You're that, yeah. And he uses Hannah Arendt a lot. You know, God doesn't give us rights. We have this religious imagery of God giving us rights, but actually state power gives us rights or takes it away. Right, yeah. And Once it's taken away, you're as good as dead. Right. This was the theologian I listened to when I was 18 years old. <laughs> Yes. Can you, but it must be traumatic <laughs> for, for a young Jewish uh, uh, scholar. Ru like. Rubenstein was a trauma that I'm very grateful for. Yeah. <laughs> now, in, in relation to, there's another book of uh, Rubenstein that I think very, especially now with this pandemic, uh, is Age of Triage, uh, in a way that also talks about, you know, uh, uh, making uh, a, a group of people superfluous or, you know, uh, unneeded, unnecessary. So, but, yeah, so they, they can be sacrificed. Uh, can you talk about that, the, the age of Well, the, the thing of history in the age of triage was one book at one point. And it was divided by the publisher, probably quite rightly, because the cunning of history is 98 pages, if I remember correctly. It's, it's devastating. And at Mary Nell, when I used to teach it, People from all over the world would read it and say, oh my God, he's talking about what happened to us. Uh, the age of triage is a part of that. And it's basically saying that we define, the powers of the world define who's important and who is unimportant. And when uh, the, the rubber hits the road, the unimportant who are basically servants of power can also be disposed of. Yeah. And that's most of the world. Yeah, but uh, I was thinking uh, today, you know, and this is quite Orwellian. Or, or really, uh, you know, the, the people who are actually sacrificed are called essential uh, workers. Well, that is <laughs> now Rubin is a neoconservative in different ways. And that's another discussion. But his analysis is quite to the point. You're right. We have these divisions within the United States and all around the world. And in societies that are deemed superfluous, you have elites, like in the Philippines, right. who basically say that 90% or more of the Philippine population is disposable. And you have a government that sponsors this overseas workers. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but basically saying that we give our, our people to the world, they'll send back remittances but they're not important to be here for our future. And then you have some Christians who believe that these overseas workers are missionaries, yeah. Christian missionaries. Uh, yeah. that, that's, uh, that's really awful. That's the whole thing. So we, we, you know, we, we also mythologize the servants of the world or what we call the essential workers in the United States. Uh, and the essential workers are saying, then why don't I have the proper health care? Why don't I have the proper income? Why are we getting sick? And the powerful say you're essential. And that's a blessing because most of the time you don't say they're essential at all, even if they are, they're just servants. So these are essential servants who pay the price. And then you have servants who aren't considered essential or named as such, but also pay the price. And they're in the same leaking boat. That's true. Now, uh, before we, you know, be, before we uh, shift gears, and before we move to the, the next part uh, of this chapter, uh, which is on the, on the, the alternative views on Israel, it, I, I would just like to comment about, you know, the, the memory is a burden, 
um, uh, and uh, I'm thinking about that uh, in relation to the, you know, the commemoration of the 500 years of the arrival of Christianity in the Philippines. And, um, you know, we, uh, as you said, per perhaps you haven't really uh, named the trauma of, of that. And we just you know, went, went uh, or maybe, as you said, it, there's another group that uh, tried to take the narrative uh, so that the other narratives uh, will not uh, 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 will be, you know, uh, hidden. Um, yeah, so it's it's a it's really a burden, but uh, uh, and that is a, a burden. I, I I think a burden of fidelity uh, to to one's history and to the the history that one uh, wants to create. Yeah, I think it's true too that if the if I hadn't been taught the Holocaust by Rubenstein when I was. Uh, entering college and that hadn't entered me in a deep way, I wouldn't have known how it was to be faithful as a Jew. So the Holocaust is, is a burden because it's so heavy and also the way it's being used and also being hit for dissenting by the Holocaust. Uh, but it's also a possibility. We, even in Holocaust theology, you had two parts, never again to the Jewish people understandable, and never again to any people. There were two parts of the first, the first uh, movement of Holocaust theology. In the end, it became never again to Jews. But in the beginning, it was never again to any people. And it didn't have to be a Holocaust. It was never again to oppression. So you either use the Holocaust as a blunt instrument against others, or as a pathway of solidarity to others, including and especially the Palestinian people. That was the choice that I put before myself and others in a Jewish theology of liberation and beyond innocence and redemption. If we're gonna create a moral future for the Jewish people, we have to choose never again to us, I agree, and never again to any people including and especially those on the other side of our power, the Palestinian people. If we oppress the Palestinian people permanently, we will not have a way forward and we will have no moral future. So the memory is a burden, but most memories that are burdensome are also pathways. And it depends what you choose within the burdensome memory. Uh, you can either close it down and close yourself down and your community down, or it can be an opening to a future beyond your suffering and the suffering of others. That's the choice. 